it comes to the OJs, hold on. Let me tell you something real quick. The OJs, right? Songs like Forever Mine, Cry Together, She Used to Be My Girl, Darling, Darling Baby, the one Big Pun used for his single, I Ain't a Player, the song Brandy, all timeless songs, all timeless tracks. You know what's crazy is uh, the song Brandy is really about a dog. I didn't know that. You know, um, the OJs as a trio have had a lot of members in the group alongside Eddie Levert and Walter Williams. Currently, um, Eric Nolan Grant, who was a friend of Gerald Levert, has been holding it down for years, performing with him. Before him, there was a guy named Nathaniel Bess. And before him, it was Sammy Strain, who used to sing with little Anthony and the Imperials. And before him, there was William Powell, who was there from the beginning, from the ground up. And he helped create that sound that would land the OJs into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, let's get into the episode about William Powell. William Powell, right, was born January 20th, 1942 in Canton, Ohio. Now, growing up, like most singers during that time, they started off singing in church. And in high school, his classmates, Eddie Levert and Walter Williams, wanted to start a doo-wop singing group after seeing Frankie Lyman and the teenagers perform in their hometown. Now, the first name they came up with was The Triumphs as a five-member band. Now see, Eddie, Walter, and William were natural singers and really could sing, while the other two, Bill Isles and Bobby Massey, kind of played the background singing background. Now see, William had the tenor voice and could hit them high notes like Eddie Kendricks. Once they became a group, they started doing local shows and ended up meeting a guy named Sid Nathan who was looking for some singers and he was impressed with their voices and he ended up signing them to James Brown's record label called King Records. After changing their name to the Mascots, they released four singles on James Brown's record label but the songs didn't make any noise. But a DJ in Cleveland named Eddie OJ loved their music though. And he decided to manage them and try to get them a record deal. Now, DJ Eddie OJ changed their names again to his last name, calling them the OJs. And started booking them shows, even getting them to do a song with Smokey Robinson and the Miracles at the time. Eddie OJ was also good friends with Barry Gordy at Motown Records and tried to get Barry Gordy to sign him, but his plate was full at the time. So he connected them with his friend in Los Angeles named H.B. Barnum. Now, once they got to Los Angeles, they did shows and released some singles like Lonely Drifter and Lipstick Traces on a Cigarette. And they did some backup vocals for Nat King Cole, but still found themselves with little commercial success. After that, they decided to come back home and try their luck once more on the East Coast in hopes of getting a better record deal. Now, once they got back home, they were offered another contract with Bell Records. And during that time, while performing at the Apollo Theater, they ended up meeting the R&B group The Intruders who had the songs uh, Cowboys, The Girls, and one of my favorite songs, I Want to Know Your Name. Now, The Intruders was signed to legendary songwriters Gamble and Huff's record label, Neptune Records, which was distributed through Chess Records. And they told him about the OJs. Now, after meeting Gamble and Huff, they signed them to their label, Neptune Records, and they released a single called One Night Affair, but once legendary music mogul Leonard Chess died from a heart attack, Gamble and Huff lost their company. After that, Billy Isles and Bobby Massey ended up quitting the group, which left the OJs a trio, and they continued to do shows. I mean, they did get an offer from Motown Records' new label called Invictus Records, ran by Lamont Dozier and Brian and Eddie Holland, but 
they turned that offer down because they were loyal to uh, Gamble and Huff during that time. Now, right after that, though, that's when they got the call from Gamble and Huff, who now had a new record label called Philadelphia International Records, distributed by CBS Records, which at the time was ran by none other than Clive Davis. And in August 1972, the OJs released their debut album titled Backstabbers and their first single also titled Backstabbers, which spent one week at number one on the Hot Soul Singles charts and peaked at number three on the Billboard Hot 100 singles. The crazy part is they didn't even like the song at first, but Gamble and Huff pushed them to do it and it worked. But their second single took them to another level. And that was the song Love Train, which reached number one on both the R&B singles and the Billboard Hot 100, giving the OJs their first and only number one record on the U.S. pop charts. Now, the album Backstabbers sold over a million copies, becoming certified platinum. And the next year, they released the second album titled Ship Ahoy on November 10th, 1973, which also went to number one on the Billboard's Black Albums charts and number 11 on the pop albums chart becoming certified platinum also at the time. Now, the single For the Love of Money was an instant hit and was nominated for the 1975 Grammy Award for Best R&B Vocal Performance by a duo, group, or chorus. And they lost to um, the song uh, Tell Me Something Good by Rufus and Shaka Khan. Man, look, every time I hear that song For the Love of Money, I think of the movie New Jack City. One of my favorite movies of all time. When Levert broke it down, when it was singing it by the fire, it had Queen Latifah rapping in it. Come on, it's crazy, man. Now, me personally, off the album Ship Ahoy, my favorite song was You Got Your Hooks in Me. But anyway, the success of that Backstabbers album and the Ship Ahoy album, the money started to roll in. And women were going crazy over them, especially William Powell. Now see, Eddie Levert, he had the powerful singing voice and Walter Williams had the smooth, cool singing voice. But William Powell had that high-pitched singing range voice and he was the pretty boy of the group who all the ladies was trying to get to. That's why uh, I seen in the Unsung episode, Eddie and Walt was talking about they had to hang around um, William to get the girls. Now, Eddie and Walt, they ended up getting married early though. But William Powell stayed single. He was the only one. He wasn't married. and He loved that life. Also, though, with money and fame comes the partying, the drinking, and the drugs. And during that time, heroin was the drug of choice. I mean, I mean, they all did it. They all admitted and said they was doing the drugs and everything. But William Powell ended up getting hooked pretty bad to the point where he started missing shows and sometimes show up high, which would affect his performance. Now, people on the label said they tried their best to get him help, but according to Walter Williams, he said William Powell told them he wasn't going to stop because he liked it. But you know, the hits kept rolling, and in April 1975, they released the album Survival with the singles Give the People What They Want, which spent one week at number one on the R&B singles charts and the song Let Me Make Love To You reached number 10 on that same chart. But see, that same year, late November, they released another album titled Family Reunion with the number one singles I Love Music and Living For The Weekend. But on that album, I, I can say my favorite song off that album, the Family Reunion album, probably was... um. Stairway to Heaven. That was my jam. That's that quiet storm right there. Also on that album, I like the song Family Reunion too. I didn't really like it at first until the movie Poetic Justice when um, Tupac and them stopped by <laughs> the Black Family Reunion to get something to eat. They had the song playing in the background. Yeah, I'm about to watch that too. And anyway though, but um, around that time, right? William Powell was still on drugs. He also ended up getting into a bad car accident. And while undergoing treatment for his injuries sustained in the car accident, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. And in the unsung episode, Eddie Levert said he remembers when uh, 
Williams, uh, when William went to the hospital, but he came back like everything was all good. Rumors also state that uh, he was assaulted and robbed after leaving the after hour spot in Cleveland around that time. But um, you know, as time passed, William became too sick and weak to travel and tour with the group. But he still was in the studio recording with them for a while. But as his health got worse, the OJs had to make the decision to replace him. And that's when they brought in um, Sammy Strain. And on May 26, 1977, William Powell died from colon cancer. The OJs set up a memorial fund in which the funds were supposed to be used for to expand a record label called Sounds of Cleveland at the time to sign Black Talent. The crazy part is, after William's death, there was a lot of money owed to him from back royalties. And at the time, his mother, who was the head of his estate, she received a court settlement of $68,000 advance with the promising of future earnings. But after his mom passed, William's family say they discovered that his estate was actually owed more than $1 million from Philadelphia International Records. There's an article I'm going to put in the, um, the description for y'all to check out about the money owed to his estate. I know his daughter and his girlfriend um, at that time spoke their mind about the whole situation in the comments section of that article. Also, I heard uh, years ago that Philadelphia International Records were also being sued by Sammy Strain, the guy who replaced William Powell for $15 million for unpaid royalties. They also say Eddie Levert and Walter Williams were also suing them. And in 2002, I know uh, Philadelphia International Records, uh, they lost a jury trial to singer Billy Paul over royalties for the song Me and Mrs. Jones. And the jury awarded Billy Paul $500,000. And they say uh, Gamble and Huff were great songwriters, but they were bad businessmen. Man, I mean, for this episode though, man, there just wasn't, much information about William Powell but I just thought he should be recognized because he did help build that sound that the OJs have and you know and the OJs don't even they really don't even mention him in interviews at all you know hopefully uh, some of his family members put out a book or a bio on him because he did play a major part in the OJs early success he was 35 years old R.I.P. William Powell.